Hey, this is Caswell Cook, and welcome to the Caswell Cook Show podcast, and we're also on WBLQ Radio. I want to tell you today I'm really excited about my guest. His name is Gilbert O'Sullivan, and so many of you know his hits all across the world. His most famous hit, Alone Again Naturally, Claire, Get Down. He's a great singer and songwriter. He's won so many awards. He's performed all over the world, and he's basically an icon in music. We're very excited that we're going to get to talk to him uh, live from England via the phone right now. And then in uh, another month or so, we're actually going to catch up with him while he's on his U.S. tour and sit down and uh, do an on-camera interview. So this is going to be great. Sit back, relax, enjoy. Gilbert O'Sullivan on the Caswell Cook Show podcast. Well, welcome to the Caswell Cook Show. Today, we are really honored to have Gilbert O'Sullivan on our show, and we're really looking forward to the 2020 American tour. And Gilbert, thanks for being with us today. Yeah, Caswell, good to be with you. Nice talking to you. So we're we're in the United States talking to you. Where are you right now? Well, I'm in Jersey, in the Channel Islands, which is where I live. Um, so it's five o'clock. It's tea time, and <laughs> it's a very English <coughs> a way of life over here. Yeah. So you know, the J- Jersey. It's the old Jersey as opposed to New Jersey. Uh, Channel Islands, about five islands just off off the British coast, and um, you know, very English, and takes half an hour to fly to London. So it's a good place to live. Nice place to bring bring up children to a healthy environment. So. Nice. Well, so we wanted to talk to you today because everyone you know, knows your distinguished career and, and a lot of your songs, but um, we know you came back to the United States for two special shows last summer, and now you've decided mm. to embark on a, a U.S. tour, first one I hear mm. in over 40 years. What, what made you want to come back to the States after all this time and do shows? Well, well, it, well it, it's, it's, it's kind of like a long story, and I'll try to sort of cut it short. The big, my major tour in America to begin with was in 1973, at the time when Claire had been, uh, sorry, Alone Again had been number one for six weeks. Claire was a number two record, sold a million copies, Get Down, sold a million copies. So my first tour was scheduled. So the key was, from the management point of view, my manager also managed Tom Jones and Anchorbutt Humperdinck, was does Gilbert go out as a support to the Moody Blues or does he go out on his own entering these big kind of theater arena type places that Tom and Anchorbutt were doing? And it was a wrong decision to put me out on my own because the, the tour got pulled about a third of the way through. We started in New York at Carnegie Hall, which was great, but getting into bigger areas, it, it just the audience just wasn't there. So the tour got pulled before I even got to the West Coast. So the so the, the following few years after that, obviously I couldn't tour in the immediate effect of that. But uh, I got involved in legal problems, which took me a long time to get sorted out. So it was about 1990 when I started touring regularly in Europe and the UK. And really, since then, we always wanted to come to America to come back to America. I had a fantastic band, had a fantastic band, about nine or ten, uh, nine or ten of us and stuff. <clears throat> but the difficulty over the last ten or so years. Uh, trying to get into you in particular was the fact that the expense of taking a whole band. So the point is that uh, with this album out now, we decided on the release of this that we would tour just my guitar player and myself, a kind of intimate, up close and personal. And it's because we took that approach as well that that America opened its door to us and and, uh, allowed us back in as a tester for the two shows in New York and Philadelphia, which went down really well. And that's led to us now doing a more dates uh, in a few months' time. So that's basically what happened. I see that you start uh, April 12th in Washington, D.C., and work your way Philadelphia, New York, Boston, Chicago, Nashville, Atlanta, California. Mm-hmm. And we even heard that you have sold out the Mint in Los Angeles months in advance. Congratulations. <clears throat> yeah, well, it's really nice when, when there's, there's a good reaction like that. It's kind of very positive for us to think that... People are that interested enough in me, particularly you know when bearing in mind how long it's been. <laughs> <laughs> well, so tell me about the single, the same, the whole world over. Well, again, it's a track from the album, just up tempo song. I mean, as a writer, I, you know, I like to combine ballads with up tempo stuff, so I don't get caught always doing the slow songs. I like, you know, my writing just, just combines all kinds of ideas and influences and stuff, and I just like to rock it out a little track like that. I so, think it's just uh, you know straightforward little rock and roll song. 
you know, tell me about how you write these songs. I mean, you, you see it from from the things I've seen about you. Obviously, I've never met you, um, but I've I've read about you. I've seen you know stuff on uh, YouTube mm. and whatnot. So it seems you have a very sort of uh, approach to writing songs that's almost like you know going in for the workday sort of thing, which seems different than a lot it, of the. It, way. It's a brill building mentality. I've always had that brill building mentality, which, as you know, is uh, the likes of Carl King, Neil Sedak, and Neil Diamond and stuff. He used to go into Don Kirshner's place in New York right. and chuck clock in at nine o'clock and leave at five, just go to a room with a little piano. So I have that, I've always had that attitude uh, just to, to work very disciplined nine to five, sit down at a piano for however, however long it takes to come up with a melody. And even if after a few days you haven't got anything, you haven't wasted your time because, you, because you're practicing. And then once I've got the melodies that I want, and I usually pull them out when it's time for a, an album to be put together, that's when I write the lyrics. I never write the lyrics until I know I'm going to be recording. So that's pretty much the approach that I've taken almost since the early 60s when I started to write. So it's a, it's a personal thing? It's something you do by yourself? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't... Uh, collaborate with anybody i just it's me in the door <laughs> <laughs> now speaking of collaborations right before i um interviewed you i was going through you know youtube and looking at the videos and i came across it now mm. i was born in 1974 so i wasn't there you know when when the first round of when you first came out but i've been a fan mm. since i can remember um mm. i saw this great duet you did speaking of working with other people it was your song get down you and elton john mm. Tell me how well, that came I, I did about. Te- well, because in 1973, I think it was 74, 73, 74, um, yeah, things were pretty big for me then. And, and uh, a TV special was scheduled for television, big television station over the years, an hour-long TV special. The director uh, was a very, a very famous director uh, of television. David Bell was his name, very, very well-renowned. And so it was suggested that Elton could be a guest now, I knew he was a fan, and so I went to visit him at his home with David, the, the director and uh, producer, and then um, Elton, you know, had a nice meeting with him, and then he agreed uh, to come on the show as a guest, uh, singing with me, and then performing, I think, uh, his, it might have been his Christmas song, Step Into Christmas. Yeah, so the, the nice experience, uh, you know, meeting him and, and uh, doing the duet, absolutely. This new album, Gilbert O'Sullivan, that you put out at the, in 2018 that you're, you're touring with now, um, your first return to the British charts in a long time, reaching top 20. Mm-hmm. How important are the charts mm-hmm. for you? I mean, I, you could say whatever you want on it, I mean, but it's got to feel good. Yeah, of course. I mean, it, it's you know recognition, whether it's uh, people liking your record or whether you're charting and stuff. It, it's, it's a recognition, not just for you, but for people who might be looking at you or, or thinking about you or wondering what happened to you. And then they see something like that and it pricks their ears up. The good thing for me is that, that I mean, that this album, um, part of the appeal of this album, I think the strength of its appeal, apart from my songwriting, I hope, is the production of Ethan Johns. Ethan Johns is Glyn Johns' son. Glyn Johns, very famous 60s producer, Rolling Stones, did The Who and stuff like that. So Ethan has a very um, analog approach, uh, organic approach to recording. All the albums recorded in my my studio. I, I have a purpose-built studio, a 48-track SSL desk, digital, but everything. But we also have the, the machines to record on tape. So everything was recorded on analog. And Ethan's approach, as I say, very organic. And I think what comes across on the record, and people have remarked on this, is the kind of similarity in its sound to my very first album, which was very successful. So I think you get that warmth when you record on tape. I think an element of that has come across on the album. So, so that was really kind of very satisfying. It's one of the reasons why working with different producers, I think, is important. Sometimes it's <clears throat> some people feel that you should work with the same producer, particularly if you've had some success with it. But I like to feel that the approach that a producer gives to the record is the same writer, the same singer. So their input can be very important. And I think Ethan's uh, proved that. And his list of people, Ryan Adams, Rufus Wainwright, I mean, the yeah. people he's worked yeah, with is yeah. impressive. Now, going back to producers, wasn't that what was part of the problem in the 70s when you were working on your songs? You had the same producer, and then you wanted to go in a different direction. That's where a lot of trouble sure. came in, and you, you had to take some time off? Yeah, I mean, about mid-70s, Gordon Mills, Gordon Mills had produced, not only managed me, but he produced my records. He did, you know, he did some great productions, Get Down, Nothing Rhyme. Alone again, wonderful production. So, but by mid seventies, things were kind of tailoring off a little. I'm still young, still very, you know, very anxious for success and stuff. So, wanting to push the button, button harder and stuff. And Gordon was kind of like, you know, just 
don't worry about things not being as successful in the last couple of years. Things will come back. You know, you're comfortable, you're wealthy, don't, you know, don't worry about it. And I, I, worry, I said to Gordon, look, um, let me work with somebody like Tom Dowd, who had done the Atlantic Crossing with Rod Stewart. I said, producer, that could be really good for us. You'd still be my manager, but, you know, it would be another producer. And Gordon's attitude was that if I don't produce, nobody will. So that's what led to the eventual breakup of the two of us. I just wanted to work with other producers, but keep him as a manager. Right. But he was determined that he had to do everything or nothing. And so that that was a you know a kind of sad time in many ways for all the good that he had done me over the years. So a really sad thing that happened. But you know, if you if you're that determined to achieve and be successful, that's what you push for. You just go for it. And so. I made that move. And then the next album was produced by Gus Dudgeon. Got very well received. We had a hit with What's in a Kiss from that. So, you know, things started to move a little bit better for me. Graham Goulman produced the next album of 10CC. Right. So, that, 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 you know, that, that's pretty much how things have gone on uh, since then. You know, so here's what I think is, is funny. So when you've, you've put out albums continuously for many years, you know, I'm looking back, mm. Piano Foreplay, A Scruff at Heart, Gilbertville. Mm. But is it funny when you put out an album and they say, you know, it's your comeback? And you're probably thinking to yourself, but I haven't gone anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of used to that. I mean, I mean, people who said, I mean, people who beat me in the streams, they thought I was dead. So, you know, <laughs> 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 I, it doesn't really bother me. I mean, the key is the work. Uh, I work, I, I'm very, the writing is the key to everything I do. Without the song, I wouldn't be talking to you. As an artist, I wouldn't be performing. It's all down to the songs. And, you know, in our concerts, we do two hours and with a break in the middle. They're all my songs. I'm very comfortable, very confident in my, with my own songs. I don't record other people's material for many reasons, not least because, you know, I don't have a great voice, but I have a distinctive voice. And my voice suits my songs, whereas I wouldn't be comfortable singing other people's songs. Maybe in, you know, in my music room, I do it on my own, but... But certainly publicly, I wouldn't do it. So it's it's all about the songwriting. The love I have of the, the songwriting craft is what you know gives me the the enthusiasm to sort of go on to make records. You know, making the album with Ethan interesting because you know he 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 met me <clears throat> and then he had to decide if he wanted to work with me and stuff. So it meant that he came to my home here, and then I would play him the melodies. I, I kind of wanted to, to rock up this album. It has quite a few little rock songs and stuff. But Ethan really didn't get into that, maybe because he's used to doing that with other artists. So therefore, I played him the kind of things that he liked, which surprised me. I mean, I always have, I've always got the material of whoever's going to be listening. There's always something that I have which will suit them. So he chose certain songs that I didn't think would necessarily be what he would want. And that's pretty much how it works. The excitement of that meant that I would write the lyrics and then we would record so the whole process, success for me very often is about writing what I think is a good song, making what I think is a good record, and then hoping that something will happen when you put it out, because that's the one thing you have no control over. Tell me about the cover of the album. It's, it's you walking along, it's, and tell me about the cover, and tell me about the name. I mean, you, you, you self-titled it. Why, you know, it was a long time since you first started making a record. Why now self-title an album? Well, well, I actually had I had other titles for it and stuff. Uh, you know, alphabetical disorder. I had some really good. I like coming up with titles and stuff. <laughs> but but the record company they kind of again harking back to my first album, which was called Himself. So I think there was an element of calling it Gilbert O'Sullivan. Uh, you know, so I just okay. I went along with it. Didn't really bother me. So that that's the reason for that. The the the, the picture was taken in in St. Juan's Bay in in Jersey. It's an area just with the sea. Uh, right, right on the edge of the the sea, and it's a sort of gangway that you just walk along. It's a sort of five mile area, very popular in the summer and stuff. So I just walked along there, and the camera guy, the photographer, just took the photo. So give us a, a casual cook show exclusive. If the album wasn't named Gilbert O'Sullivan, what was the runner up? I, I told you, I think it would. My, I, I got a whole list of them, but one of my <laughs> favorites was Alphabetical Disorder. That, so that would have been okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I have others and stuff, but um, so that was that, that was that, that would have been one of them. That was I your sense. Liked it. You see, I, yeah, I, I kind of liked. It's kind of fun to come up with titles. You know, every song has its play. It was a good title. I think Latin Allergy was the album before Gilbertville, which is a sort of tribute to Peggy Lee and stuff. Uh, and, and, so it's kind of nice to come up with with titles and things that are not. You know, that, that, that. but anyway, you know. But my Gilbert favorite Sullivan, is my yeah. favorite's the the Berry Vest. Barry Vestal, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and why Gilbert O'Sullivan from Raymond? Uh, well, because when I started off, going back 60, 66, 
what happened was that in 66, I was in a really good band. I'd started off in a school band. The Beatles kind of were the catalyst for everybody wanted to be in a band. And so therefore, my first band were a school band. Then I moved to a youth club band, Getting Better. And the third band was a band called Rick's Blues. <clears throat> that was Rick Davis who taught me how to play blues piano. He was a Super brilliant, tramp. is a brilliant musician. Yeah, Rick is a brilliant musician. I mean, he's just, and he had this room above his mother's hairdressing shop. where He's a great drummer too. I mean, he's just a wonderful musician, harmonica player. And so the band we were in, of course, we made a couple, you know, we, we made a few recordings. They were my songs. It's a bit like him and Roger Hodgson of Supertime. Roger wrote the kind of commercial songs. Rick writes the kind of album uh, album tracks and stuff. So anyway, <clears throat> Rick uh, and, and the band we were in, Rick's Blues, we thought we could have turned professional. But the bass player and the guitar player were on uh, apprenticeships. So they, they didn't want to risk uh, giving up their jobs. That meant that Rick and I had to decide what to do. He needed to be in a band, so he went on to for, to join a band called The Joint, which ended up becoming Supertram. And then I ended up going to London, creating this character called Gilbert, uh, not O'Sullivan. The O'Sullivan you'd see on the writing credit, but you wouldn't see the artist's name other than Gilbert. So this sort of character thing, I had Charlie Chaplin jacket, and I had you know everybody had long hair in the 60s, and I had really... I had hair the way everybody has hair now, which is really short. And so that, that's, you know, that's what started it for me. I had the songs. Nobody liked how I, I looked. Everybody said I should look like James Taylor, grow my hair long, wear a denim shirt and jeans, and kind of look like a college student, which was the key in 67, 68 and stuff. But I didn't care. I just wanted to look different. Uh, I knew my songs would be the reason if I was going to be successful. And in the end, it kind of proved that because the first success, Nothing Rhymed, it was a really good song, and yet you had this image of this guy who looked really weird. So I kind of, I, you didn't really get that. You only got me with the college sweater. I think the image that I created after establishing that first image, then I moved on to the college sweater. I saw a Buster Keaton film, <laughs> and he was wearing that college sweater, so I thought that would make a... You know, just images are, are fun to play around with, because it's not the serious work. The serious work is always the writing. So the fun part is just to play around with images and stuff, you know. But it got me into a lot of trouble. And I certainly lost a lot of the sales because there's no doubt my first album would, you wouldn't want to be seen walking around the campus with a guy looking the way that I looked. And so I understood that. <laughs> and, and I understood why the record companies didn't like it. I understood why Gordon Mills didn't like it. But because I was so determined to use it, people backed off and said, okay. But everybody so knows, everybody knows still went to number eight in the UK, so... Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It did. No, it, it was good. No, I, I, you know, I have no regrets. But there's no question I would have sold more records, looking the way that everybody looked at that time. Because long hair was here to stay. Image was a dirty word. You just had to look the way, you know, the, uh, look like your audience and stuff. And I didn't do that. Uh, yeah, and Elton, I, I've heard Elton say not quite recently actually that he was asked why he dressed up in those crazy outfits and he said well part of the problem being a piano player is that unlike a guitar player you're not moving around the stage you can't move around the stage so therefore you're stuck on a stool at the piano so therefore if you can, if you can create something that make people gawk at you and wonder what the hell is that perhaps that gets over the stiffness of just been sitting at the piano going all the way back to jerry lee lewis who kicked the piano bench over yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and played absolutely. with his feet once in a while. That's true. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes, he did. Yeah. <laughs> I wanted to ask you a question um, because th there was a song you put out uh, in 1973, Everybody Knows, which didn't chart at all in the UK, which was... It was a B-side. That, yeah. that was a B-side. But it went way up to okay. number two on the U.S. Uh, adult contemporary charts and up to number 17. So why did that... What When you write a song, you probably don't know if it's going to be a hit or not, but, but what was the what was the reaction when that one was a hit in America and not in the UK, when everything else was almost the reverse of that? Carol, well, I I, are you sure about that? I'm looking at it. I don't think it. that can be right. Yeah. Everybody yeah. knows. I mean, that, that was just a B-side. Just a, you know... I oh, I'm like sorry. It's, it, the, it's the A-side, out of the question. Out of the question. There you go. There you go. <laughs> well, out of the question, the nice thing about out of the question was it was... That was... That was recorded on the session with Alone Again. In those days, you wouldn't have a week or two weeks or three months or two years to make an album. In 1970, 71, 69, you had three hours to do two tracks. Normally, it would be an A-side and a B-side. Uh, but but uh, the two tracks that we were doing uh, were out of the question and Alone Again. And everybody said on the session, uh, the people involved in the record company, that out of the question should be the single. Uh, they thought Alone Again was just not... not not commercial enough. But in the end, Gordon decided that he, we, we should go with Alone Again. Even if it wasn't a big hit, it was a better song. And so that was the story behind that. <clears throat> Out of the question in the States, I mean, it was, you know, it's, it's, 
I've had fans write to me from America whose favorite song of mine is that. Yeah, it's, it's a good, I like the middle because it's good chord changes. <laughs> I kind of like, I like those. Mo- I like moving around in middle eights and going off in some area and then struggling to get back. <laughs> we're talking. We're we're in the midst of our conversation, but I wanted to remind our audience who we're talking to. We're talking to Gilford O'Sullivan, who's kicking off his U.S. tour on April 12th in Washington D.C., taking him through to uh, Los Angeles and all through the states. Um, I wanted to ask you about the concerts that we're going to see. So we know it's going to be you mm-hmm. and the guitar player. So it's Gilbert Unplugged. Mm-hmm. Um, what What do you are do you go like with the Bob Dylan method, where you just make up the song, the set list before you go on, or you kind of like the McCartney method, where you where you stick to the same set? How do you come up with a set? Set for a tour or a oh, show. I have to. St- I have to. St- I have to stick to because I'm because if if I allowed people to pick out numbers, I'd know what they were asking for, but I wouldn't have a clue how to play it <laughs> because because I don't I don't spend much time going over my old songs. Right. If you know when when a tour when a tour is put together, the thirty odd songs that we're doing, a lot of them I have to relearn. Mm-hmm. In fact, some of them I uh, some of them I have to ask uh, a guy who reads music to tell me what the what the hell I'm playing. <laughs> Because I, you know, I just don't spend time. I'm spending time doing new stuff, and so yeah. therefore I'm not spending time playing the old songs. And a lot of the chord structures I do in many of the songs are really quite unusual. So I have to work really hard to to learn. So I wouldn't do that. So 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 the songs I do are, are preset, uh, but which is also important because there's a lot of words. And so you know, if you sing the thirty odd songs. Uh, over two hours, you need to make sure you're able to say every word and not, I don't have a prompter or anything to, I just, um, you know, I have a running order on the piano and <laughs> I just go for it. So no auto-tune, no teleprompters, nothing. You're just going to be, you're going to be, no, 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 yeah, just, that's yeah, great. Just go for it, yeah. Well, that's what people, for. I mean, my guitar, my, you know, my guitar player, Bill, uh, he's played with, Ray, you know, Ray Davis of the Kinks. I mean, sure. uh, Bill has always been a sideman for Ray. And the nice thing for me is that that uh, well, the bad thing would be if if Ray was out working now, then I wouldn't have Bill. But Ray's off the road for quite a long time now, so it's good for me because Bill is a wonderful guitar player. He's one of Ireland's finest guitar players, so I'm very lucky to have him. Um, <clears throat> but it's 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 the uh, no, I mean it's I don't really forget words, but I, but I sometimes um, I have to have a little you know I, a little bit of paper stuck on the keyboard to <laughs> I might miss a line or two here and there and stuff but it's a lot of words I, 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 would think, of words. I would think the audience would be very forgiving <laughs> <laughs> they're there with you they're yeah. there. and and i think yeah. with, with the things yeah. that i've read about the way you're doing this show is it feels like you're almost in their living in the living room with them yeah yeah it's up close and personal there's something nice about that we, we meet people after the show I and mean, we did one just the other day in holland and stuff and people have the show and they say we've seen the band we love it with the band but we really like this better because it allows us to hear the lyrics more clear and that used to be the criticism I have with the band. It's still the criticism we get with the band. We're a bit too loud. But of course, with the band, we like to rock it up. So I really like having the band, <clears throat> you know, with, I just love all that. But this way is different. And as I say, it allows the words to become clearer for people. So it's very up close and personal. So people say it's a bit like, you know, you're with them in your own front room and stuff. There's something nice about that. It's worked out really well. Are we going to get to hear a good chunk of the new album on this tour? Well, you hear the few songs. It, it's over 30 songs, so you'll get all the hits, all the, the ones that people expect to hear. Album tracks that, that people pick out on, which is nice, bearing in mind how many albums I've released. And thirdly, there'll be a sample of the new material, three or four of them. And uh, that's pretty much how it should work. Um, I wouldn't fall into the trap of playing the whole album, <laughs> whole <laughs> well, new album. Well, let me ask you this <laughs> one last question, um, and I thank you for taking the time today. What, so when you have songs that, you know, just are in the stratosphere, they're, they're part of like, you know, they're part of the mm. DNA of the world, like Alone Again, like Claire, like mm. Get Down. Um, mm. Is this something when you, when you play those songs live, are you like, oh, I know I've got to play these because the, they expect it? Or... What, what do you think now, fifty years on from those songs, or forty-five years on from those songs? Where are they in your in your mind when you're playing them in your heart? Are they? Is it a pleasure to play them still? Yeah, it is, and every every show is 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 uh, is like a starting thing. I, the key is that the sound is right and stuff, and, and that I that I sing well. I work really hard with my voice. Uh, I'm seventy three years of age now, so I work really hard to maintain a good voice. You know, I, I know if you think, think of Rod Stewart, Rod Rod. You know, the reason Rod's able to do those albums, The Great American Song, because it's because he's dropped his voice to be able to sing softer. Whereas if you hear him singing Maggie May now, it's not quite, you know, Elton has to be careful too because you can push it too far. So I work really hard to keep my voice in order. And the other thing is, 
um, the work guy. I'm slightly off. What was it? Just answer your question again. There. Uh, whether you still like playing the the original, the the older st- material. Yeah. So yeah. So here's yeah. So here's the thing. You know. So every night is a tester for me, and I put my heart and soul into every performance. If I'm if if the sound isn't quite right, I'll be really upset afterwards. If the sound is good, and 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 I, and I come, I, you know. But if it the sound is good. And I'm happy with my voice. It's magic and stuff. So every song, no matter how old, is is a first performance. The interesting thing with Alone Again is that when I rehearse for the tour, uh, the first half, and usually what I do is the first half on one day and the second half on the second day. And that's generally how I get in, in, in keeping for a tour. But I never rehearse Alone Again singing the vocal. Uh, mm. I always play it, uh, but I don't sing it because of the words. I, I think I don't want to, to, to be throwing it away in a, even in a rehearsal. So I so I leave it off in rehearsing and, and I wait till um, we go out on the night. But it's just important that I perform it as good as I ever could, not just for my own sake, but for the people who are listening to me. God forbid I should be throwing it away. I mean, that would be would be dreadful, I think. Well, I want to thank you so much for talking to us. We're really looking forward to the U.S. tour. We're hoping uh, to catch up with you in Boston and, and have you do the TV version of this show. Um, and thank you so much. We're, we're uh, just thrilled to have you on the show, and it's great success on the U.S. tour. Yeah, thanks, Caswell. It was really nice talking to you. I look forward to meeting up with you guys. Absolutely. We'll see you soon. Thank you, Gilbert. Okay, take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.